How many of you, uh, by show of hands, consider yourself to be an optimist? Right. So if you didn't put your hands right up, you're not an optimist, right? I don't know, am I? How many of you think, how many of you would say you're a pessimist? Less, less or, how many of you think you're a realist? Got news for you, you're a pessimist in denial. <laughs> do, you, do you know people that, that approach life like this? If I expect the worst possible thing to happen, then I'll never be disappointed. You know anyone like that? Anybody elbowing someone next to them? Or, or do you ever feel like this? You know people that do. When things are going really well in your life, you start to get a little nervous. Because that's about the time that something's going to go wrong. You ever feel that way? Some of you are chuckling because the person next to you feels that way. I know some folks like that. Today we begin a new, uh, second part of a series, which is really part of a year-long study of the book of Acts. We were in the first three chapters studying the explosive growth of, growth of the church. How God, through his Holy Spirit, ignited this small band of, of followers of Jesus, and they began to shake up Jerusalem and soon the rest of the Roman world. But in the first three chapters, we see remarkable mass conversions, we see miraculous healings, and a lot of exciting things happening. Now, the next series is called Growing Pains, because as the church grows, it faces some opposition, both internally and externally. That's the theme of the next series we'll be in as we go through chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 3, as you remember, ended with Peter giving his second great evangelistic sermon to a crowd that had gathered to see what had happened. They, they saw this miraculous healing of a man that was born lame. He, he was laid at the beautiful gate of the temple on a daily basis to beg alms. Peter and John healed him miraculously. Not surprisingly, people who knew this man were surprised. They gathered around to hear what was going on. Peter's given this power, spirit-filled sermon, and then it draws uh, the attention of some of the religious leaders. Let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. You can follow on the screens or in your Bibles if you have them with, with you. Or, by the way, if you have one of your Acts journals, I should have mentioned that, uh, we have these Acts journals, which has the entire book of Acts in the English Standard Version, as well as space for your notes. So if you're a note taker and you like to do that, you can pick one of those up today. I believe we have some left as well. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you, did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. We'll stop there. I don't know if you caught that. So again, the context, Peter and John, through the power of the Spirit in them and in the name of Jesus, perform a miracle, heal a beggar, draws a crowd, not surprisingly. Peter's preaching this remarkable Spirit-filled sermon the second sermon in the history of the church. While doing so, leaders of the Jewish community hear about the ruckus and want to know what it's all about because it's happening near, nearby, near the temple. They gather around and they hear them preaching in the name of Jesus. Not only that, but they hear them proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. They're annoyed by this. While they're dragging Peter and John away to be arrested, 5,000 men are converted. Did you catch that? While they're dragging them off, 5,000 men, which is about 10,000 people, give or take, have their hearts changed by the grace of God while they're being dragged off to prison. I mean, if they busted in here to arrest me tonight, most of you would be like, oh, okay, we go dinner early? What is, what's the, I, that's, the, I, that's, that's bad for Pastor Jeff, somebody should do something, but I got, you know. 5,000 people are converted while that's happening. It's a remarkable thing that's going on. Now, a little background here. The group that Peter and John now are being arrested by and standing on trial before is a group called the Jewish High Council or the Sanhedrin. 
71 members, 70 members plus one the high priest. It was kind of like our Supreme Court and Congress all rolled into one. They were underneath Roman authority, but, but as long as they didn't cause trouble for Rome, they had supreme authority in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area. They were the highest religious and civil authority to a Jew. It's a remarkable thing that's happening. A little more than a month ago, this same group, the Sanhedrin, was the very group, the very same high priest, Caiaphas and Annas, who strong-armed Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, into having Jesus crucified. Peter and John are now standing in front of that same group of men on trial. At the time of Jesus' arrest, Peter denied he even knew him to a servant girl. Think about that for a minute. Peter, the one on trial, the one proclaiming boldly the message of the gospel, just over a month ago, when, when, when confronted by a servant girl outside the high priest's house, if he knew Jesus, said no three times and ran off into the night. Now, 30-some days later, he's standing in front of this same group that he was afraid of, proclaiming something remarkable. Something has happened to this man. It's not the same guy. The first thing we see here is that for those who want to truly follow Jesus, opposition is unavoidable. I don't mean that for those who want to come to church on occasion, for those who want to feel mildly spiritual, for those who want to give and serve and feel good about their own religious life, I mean for those who want to follow Christ, opposition is unavoidable. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will face persecution. It's a given. And yet it surprises us. And yet in our culture we feel as if somehow that God has betrayed us or abandoned us when we face opposition. Now, we, the church in America, rarely face physical persecution, although there are many places around the country where this is common. Pastor Bruce and Pastor Brian, I'm sure you heard last week from Pastor Brian, recently in Dubai, talked to many Muslim converts to Christianity who are estranged from their family, facing physical consequences for their conversion to Christianity. But we do face opposition in our country. Even though we don't face persecution physically, we do face opposition. And it comes, I think, in a dangerous and more hidden form. The prevailing secular humanism of our culture, but even more so, materialism, the gods of comfort, security, respectability, and acceptability, all of those things oppose the work of the gospel in your heart. You face opposition, and it is the work of the enemy. It's just not quite as obvious not quite as in your face, but it can be just as deadly to our souls. It may be our greatest opposition. So whether the opposition we face comes from individual persecution or from cultural forces that pull us away from Christ and what he wants to do, we have a great deal to learn from these men here in Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 12 again with me from Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> and there is salvation in no one else, Peter says, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, let's be honest for a minute. That kind of statement in our culture today is part of why the mainstream American culture views Christians as narrow, intolerant, bigoted even. There's no other name? How can you say there's no other name? You've got to grow out of that, you Christians. I mean, it's fine to believe in Jesus. Believe in him all you want. Just stop saying he's the only way for everyone. Who are you to claim that? By the way, this statement was just as offensive in that first century as it is in the 21st century. For first century Jews, the message of the gospel was far too inclusive. Let me explain what I mean. Salvation for the Gentiles, the pagan unbelieving Gentiles, apart from obedience to the law, the Old Testament law of Moses, through a carpenter's son from Nazareth who died a criminal's death, that made no sense. That's way too inclusive. That's not how God planned it. God called his special people the Jews, gave them the law. You can't have salvation outside of that. Now, in the Roman world, the gospel was not too inclusive. It was far too exclusive. Rome's official policy was pluralism. As long as you bent the knee to Caesar, you could worship any god you wanted to. As long as you bent the knee to Caesar and didn't cause trouble and paid your taxes to Rome. Polytheism, pluralism, that's fine. Lots of gods, the more the merrier. And here come the Christians saying, no other name, no other name given among men by which we must be saved. So you see, in, the, in that first century culture, for some, the gospel's too inclusive. Makes no sense. For some, it's too exclusive. It's not that different today. 
the gospel breaks the categories we set for it. Japanese Christian pacifist and leader Toyohiko Kagawa, if you want to Google him, he's a great, you can read his memoirs or some of the books he's written. He was a missionary to the, very, the poorest of the poor in Japan. He writes this about the gospel and how it changed his life. He grew up, by the way, son of a concubine in a wealthy family. His parents died when he was young, and he went on a journey. He was raised uh, as a Buddhist and Confucianist, and he sought Islam, and he sought the Tao, and then he eventually converted to Christianity. Here's what he writes. I am grateful for Shinto Buddhism and Confucianism and Islam. I owe much to these faiths, yet these faiths utterly failed to minister to my heart's deepest needs. I was a pilgrim journeying on a long road that had no turning. I was weary and foot sore. I wandered through a dark and dismal world where tragedies were thick. Buddhism teaches great compassion. But since the beginning of time, who has declared this is the blood of the covenant poured out for many unto the remission of sins? Islam, of course, proclaims the mercy of Allah. Each chapter begins in the name of Allah, the most merciful and compassionate. But they do not tell of a costly display of God's mercy as portrayed by the cross and proclaimed in the Gospels. In Islam, Allah is merciful to the meritorious, those who pray, fast, give alms. In Christianity, God is merciful to the sinner, not because of their good works, but because of his great love and sacrifice. I love that, what, he, what, what Kagawa writes here. He says, look, there's truth about how to live. There's moral goodness in other faiths, but they could not change my heart. They could not transform my life only thing that did that was the gospel. This Jesus, you know, I, I often hear people say things like, it's fine to believe in Jesus, just don't claim he's the Jesus, he's the, he he's, has to be the way for everyone. You can believe in Jesus. Okay, but think about that for a minute. You're free to believe in Jesus, but don't claim he's the only way to God. Well, what about the Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except through me. What about the Jesus who said, before Abraham was born, I am, in John chapter 8, and the Jews picked up stones to kill him because they knew that he was claiming to be God. Which Jesus am I free to believe in, in other words? The only Jesus we have, friends, is the Jesus of the Gospels. And he said some pretty radical things about who he is and what he came to do. It's important to keep in mind here that Peter and John are not spiritual superheroes. These are not, I think it's sometimes we read the Gospels and we think, these people are beyond me. These are a different race of spiritual being. No, they're not. They're uneducated, common, ordinary people, fishermen, who have been changed by the power of the resurrection, an encounter with the risen Jesus. That same encounter is available today. Now I want to examine four characteristics of, this, of, of their lives in the face of opposition as we go here. The first thing. They were concerned about obeying Christ. Concerned about obeying Christ. Look at verse 20, or verse 19, excuse me. Uh, we didn't read this far, but I'll read it for you. So uh, verse 18, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach it all in the name of Jesus. That's, that's pretty humorous, actually. All right, stop it, you two. Stop talking about Jesus. Verse 19, Peter said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. In other words, I'm not concerned about obeying you. I'm concerned about obeying Christ. I'm concerned about his opinion above all. When I was at Wheaton College and I was playing football, a, buddy, a, a guy that was a mentor to me, an older man on the team, older young man on the team when I was a freshman, uh, gave me a little card. He said, it said, play for an audience of one. I don't think I ever understood how to play a sport for the glory of God until I was in college around those guys. Be concerned about one person's opinion on the field, in your workplace, in your home, in the quietness of your heart. Are you concerned about obedience to Jesus Christ? Is it the first thing you think about? What's his opinion of this action, of these words, of this behavior, of this part of my life? What does he think? Opposition, by the way, really not should surprise us. I remember a tiny church plant I went to visit in Russia many years ago as a kind of a delegation from our church. We were supporting a church for many years. They were preaching the gospel of this church plant to the gypsy community in Samara, Russia. Their primary opposition, by the way, came from within the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, their, their little church building was firebombed, graffitied, vandalized numerous times, and they came to find out it was the Russian Orthodox Church. It came from within. Who are the primary opposers of the gospel here? Pagans? No. Jews. The religious establishment, it comes from inside. 
And Peter and John are Jews. But they're saying, look, my life's been changed by Jesus. I owe him my allegiance before anyone else. The second thing, after concerned about obeying Christ, is being confident in Christ. Confident in Christ. Now, I want to talk about Peter for a minute. You might remember a couple of years ago, Pastor Brian and I did these um, first-person monologues around Easter time, where we pretended as if we were uh, characters out of the Gospels um, who are witnesses to the resurrection. And when I was studying to write Peter's monologue, I poured over the scriptures that tell us about Peter's life, read some historical accounts, and even a couple of novels about imagining what his life would have been like, and it dawned on me that Peter was an impetuous guy, first guy out of the boat to walk on water, first guy to pick up a sword in the garden, the one who said to Jesus, when Jesus was predicting his death, don't talk that way, Jesus is bad for morale. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You know, not the best thing to have Jesus call you Satan. Peter was a bold guy by nature. We're not all naturally courageous people, but Peter was. And God had to strip him of that natural courage, I think. Break it down, tear it down to nothing. Because Peter was the one that denied him, betrayed him. And ran out in the night weeping bitterly. And then in John 21, Jesus reinstates him, restores him. Now his courage that we read about here is not the same as it was prior to the resurrection. It's not the same guy. It's a different kind of courage. Verse 7, chapter 4. I had not seen this until last week studying this text. I did not recognize what's going on here. And when they had set them in the midst, that means in the midst of the council, the, the Sanhedrin, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Now think about that. They know what power and by what name. They arrested them. Why? Because they're proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. They're not confused about their message. Why would they ask? I think they're giving them an out. Boys, just say you didn't mean it. Don't do it anymore. And we'll let you off. They know what power and what name. And Peter has a chance here. Peter could say, okay, okay, you know, we're sorry, we'll back off. And what does Peter say? His, his response is really outstanding. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. That's the fifth time Peter has said, since Acts chapter 1, you killed him, <laughs> the people, right? So you get what's going on here? We'll give you a pass, we'll give you an out, a technicality, if you'll just not mention Jesus. And Peter says, okay, you want to put us on trial for healing a, a lame guy? You killed God. Now who's on trial? It's an incredible thing that he does. Peter turns the tables on them. This leads us to the, sec the third point, courageous because of Christ. So concerned about obeying Christ, confident in Christ, in who he is. And third, courageous because of him. Verse 13, it's I think my favorite verse. Well, I don't know. Certainly in the book of Acts so far, <laughs> in the first four chapters. Uh, verse 13. Now when they, that's the Sanhedrin and the Jewish authorities, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they took note. They recognized these men had been with Jesus. When they saw the courage, the boldness of Peter and John, they couldn't figure it out. People don't act this way in front of us. We have the power here. Nobody talks this way to us. Where did this come from? They're either drunk or they're insane, but this is not normal behavior standing on trial before the Sanhedrin. And then it dawned on them, there's nothing special about these guys. Where does courage come from in our culture, in life? When I was in football, and you could take it on faith now, but there was a day when I used to compete many, many years ago. But my coaches used to tell us, it comes from your training. How hard do you prepare and how hard do you train? That's where you draw strength when you're out in competition. You know how hard you prepare, you've prepared for this. You know you're ready. Therefore, you're courageous and confident because of your preparation. And that happens in life too, right? I studied hard for the final exam. I worked hard at it. I know that I'm ready. I walk in with confidence. That didn't happen to me too often when I was in school, but some, I've heard it happens for those who study hard, right? You walk in and you're confident on test day. Or, or, or for if it's a job interview, whatever it is, right? Sometimes we draw courage from our preparation. That's not a bad thing. Or, or perhaps it comes from those around us. I myself am not that big a deal, but I've got some powerful friends. I've got those who have my back, people to support me in my life, and I draw courage and confidence from those that are around me, my family, my friends, my coworkers, whatever it is. They look at Peter and John, and they say, these guys are not from important families. They don't have powerful friends. They don't have an educational pedigree. 
They don't have an economic or sociological, I mean, they're not, they're socioeconomically, nothing special about these guys. They have no position or, or, or no friends or no social circles that should give them this kind of boldness. Where does it come from? In the last line of verse 13, they recognized what? That they had been with Jesus. Say that with me. They recognized what about them? They had been with Jesus. Is there a better compliment that could ever be paid to you or to me in our life than for those around us when, when the fire comes, when trials come, when opposition comes, when pain comes, than for them to look at our lives and say, the way she's handling this, the way he's responding to this is just different. He's been with Jesus. I see Jesus in her, in him. It's a beautiful thing that's happening here. The only explanation they can come up with for the courage and the boldness and the grace of Peter and John in this moment was that they'd been with this Jesus guy. There's just something different about them. But wait a minute. Hadn't they been with Jesus all along? Hadn't they been with Jesus for three years before he was arrested and then they all scattered? They had been with the resurrected Jesus. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit and had Christ in them. In fact, Brian talked about this last week. Pastor Brian, look at verse 29 of chapter 4. And now, O Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Did you catch that? If you're on trial before the highest authority in the land and you know they have the power to put someone to death because they did it to your best friend and master, and they let you off with a stern warning, what would be your first prayer? I think, if I'm honest, mine would be, thank you, Lord, that was close. Thank you, I'll be careful from now on. Thank you for getting me out of that one. That's not what they pray. They say, Lord, look on their threats and let us be even more bold for you. Let nothing stop us. Last. They were courageous because of Christ, and finally, they cannot help talking about Christ. They can't help it. Look here at verse 20 of chapter 4, or verse 19. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. In other words, we can't help it. It's, it, it's unstoppable. I can't, I couldn't stop talking about Jesus even if I tried. It's coming out, right? I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. I cannot help talking about Jesus. I met a man in Angola. I've talked about this before, I think, in the past. Uh, Angola is the name given to uh, the town and the uh, maximum security prison in Louisiana. It's the largest maximum security prison in our country. 6,000 inmates. It covers about 18,000 acres. It's bigger than, uh, than Long Island. It um, is, a, is a, an incredible place, a very dark place. The uh, Louisiana has the harshest sentencing in our country. They're on the Napoleonic legal system, the laws, and so um, life, by definition, in Louisiana is life without possibility of parole. You don't go to Angola unless you have a sentence of 50 years or more. The average sentence in Angola is 80 years. 90% of the men there are never getting out. They have more men on death row in Angola than any other single penitentiary, federal or state in our country. It's a harsh and dark place. Yet, because of the ministry of a man, a man named Burl Cain, the warden there, who's a strong believer, the gospel's been brought to that place, and we, there's a remarkable transformation happening as well. It's an amazing contrast of darkness and light in that prison. When I was there for the very first time in a prayer trip to prepare for a time I went down to speak, and some men from our church went with me, I met a man named Ron Hicks. Ron is about late 40s. He uh, was sentenced to life without possibility of parole when he was 21 years old. He shot and killed an innocent bystander in a gang-related shooting in the streets of New Orleans when he was 21 years old. Grew up without a father, very tragic story, very common story, unfortunately. He's in there and he's never getting out. He said when he came there, it was a brutal, dark place. Homosexuality was rampant. There was blood spilled, guard on inmate and inmate on inmate violence on a daily basis. When he got off the bus, he was said he was so scared. And the first thing someone told him was, find or make or buy yourself a weapon if you want to survive in here. He said the guy next to him on, in his first night in prison slept with magazines rolled up under, over his stomach when he slept because he was afraid someone would stab him in the middle of the night. 
And Ron Hicks was just terrified. Over about 10 years, he came to Christ. He had a radical conversion experience through some preaching in the prison, gave his heart to Jesus. It wasn't a jailhouse conversion, a genuine conversion. <clears throat> and he said he was beginning to grow in his faith. He was listening to a sermon given by an inmate pastor in one of their chapel services. And that pastor said to him, unless you are giving your life away, serving others and sharing the gospel with them, you'll never grow into the mad God wants you to be, whether you're inside or outside of prison. You've got to serve other people. You've got to share the gospel and serve in the name of Christ other people or you'll never grow. And Ron Hicks thought, well, how am I going to do that? I, yes, I had a burning desire to tell people about Jesus, but how am I going to do that? I'll never get out to tell people about Jesus. Then he said it dawned on him, I don't have to get out. They keep bringing them in. He said, my goal, my mission then is to be the first one to meet the bus. When those guys get off the bus who were where I was 20 plus years ago, I want to be there to tell them not to buy a weapon, but this is not the end of their life. It can be the beginning. I want to share the gospel with them. He's an amazing man. He cannot help talking about Jesus even inside a horrible, dark, and yet beautiful prison can't help talking about Christ. I want to ask you a question. What is it that you cannot help talking about? People that get to know you, you know, if you spend time with somebody, you know what, the, what they're into, right? That guy really likes politics. Don't go over there unless you want to have a political debate, right? Because that guy's into that. Or man, she cannot stop talking about her kids or her son or whatever they're doing or, or whatever you're into, sports, fantasy, football, whatever your thing is. We talk about it. Why do we do that? And I'm not saying that's wrong. We talk about the things that we care about. Why? Because those are the things that we spend time in. Those are the things that we invest our resources in. Those are the things that we immerse ourselves in. So we talk about them. It's natural. We can't help it. You see where this is going? What if we immersed ourselves in the gospel? What if we immersed ourselves in a relationship with Jesus Christ more than once a week? What if we immersed ourselves in his word? We would not be able to stop talking about it. I don't know about you, but this is not always easy for me. Last week, I was with my son visiting a Drake University out in Iowa. We were watching a football game. He's thinking about where he's going to go to school. We had a great time. We went to Jethro's for barbecue afterwards. By the way, if you're ever in Des Moines for whatever reason, I highly recommend Jethro's. Unbelievable barbecue, but that's not the point of the story. And so we're at our table, and we're, they're bringing our food. And I hear the, our server at the table next to us. She's talking to these two guys who she clearly knows outside of the restaurant. And she says, my grandmother recently died. I could tell that she was close to her grandmother, and she's very emotional. And they're saying, oh, that's too bad. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I should talk to her. I should offer to pray for her. I should encourage her in some way. And I'm having this little debate. Maybe I can even talk about Jesus with her. But then I'm thinking, but my brisket is already here, and it's so good. I don't know if I should. I don't know her. Who am I to talk to her about? I have this little debate. You ever do that in your head? Like, ah, I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to be... I did talk to her about Jesus. She didn't get saved or anything, but I did mention it to her. I, I have to muster up the courage sometimes. Are you like that sometimes? Ah, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? What are they gonna, how are they going to view me? What, what if we were the kind of people, with grace, without being in your face, with kindness, but what if we were the kind of people who could not help it? Like, we just can't stop talking about him. I have a good friend. I think I've shared this before. He's... Um, I get to know him very well recently, and he told me that he decided, he, he, he felt guilty that he had like a work, whenever someone asks you, how was your weekend, like on Monday morning, he said he felt like he had a work answer and a Christian answer to the question, how you doing? The work answer, you know, the, the regular answer is, well, you know, I'm this and that, and things are going okay, but the church answer was talk about his faith and about how things are really going. He decided, I don't want to be two people anymore, I'm just going to answer him honestly, and honestly, his, he was really growing in Christ. So he'd go to work, and people would say, how, how was your weekend? He'd go, it was amazing, we had this incredible worship service, and, my, and they'd be like, whoa, whoa, dude, easy, you know? He said, it, he said it freaked some people out. Some people stopped asking me how I was doing, right? But he also said I had remarkable opportunities to begin to talk about the love of Christ, with those who wanted to know. I'll just leave you with these last two things. Is there a better compliment that can be paid to you or to me than for people to look at our lives in good times and in hard times and say that person has been with Jesus? And let's be the kind of men and women, young and old, that can't help talking about his love and his grace. Let's bow together in prayer. God, we bow before you humbly but gratefully. We fall far short of the standards set for us in your word, but we know you have redeemed us and paid for all our failures and shortcomings. God, forgive us for our, our frivolous pursuits. Draw us close to you. Help us to be immersed in your word and your gospel so that we would be the kind of people who could say in, in truth that we cannot help 
but talk about how good and great and loving and gracious you are. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.